Well, hello everyone and welcome to unit three. This unit is uh, going to focus on cells. And we're going to start by looking at the scientist who named them cells. You might wonder why they're named cells. Well, this man right here named Robert Hooke, long, long ago in the 17th century, he used his microscope to look at some cork, uh, thin slices of cork. Now, just so you know, cork is actually from uh, dead the dead bark of certain kinds of oak trees. Um, so it is no longer alive, but it once was alive. And when he looked through his microscope, he saw little structures that looked like boxes. And they were empty, and you could see right through them. But he, it reminded him of monks. So he named them cells, and that's why they were named cells, because those are the rooms that monks lived in. So that's where cells got their name. He published his work and found uh, that as he looked through his microscope at living organisms like leaves and plants, he started to see the same kinds of what he was calling cells. Only in living organisms, the cells had fluid in them and also small other little pieces inside of them, and he wasn't quite sure what they were yet. So we have another scientist here, Robert Brown, um, in 1831. He noticed the dark spot uh, inside of the cell, and he decided to name it a nucleus. So uh, he called that dark spot a nucleus. Not yet sure what it did, but then we had a man named M.J. Schleiden who continued this work and continued to reaffirm the idea that cells contain nuclei and fluid. So in 1839, um, this man, Theodore Schwann, um, began to examine animal parts under the microscope. Up until that point, the focus had been on plants, and he found that animals, lo and behold, also contained cells that are uh, fluid-filled sacs and have a nucleus in them. Um, and then this man right here, Anton von Leeuwenhoek, uh, kind of an interesting name, he, he came along 30 years after Hooke's initial discovery of cells. And he examined uh, water, pond water, water from rivers and um, rain collecting, wa rain collected water. And he started to find tiny little creatures. Um, and it was very interesting because people soon became interested in looking for microorganisms in soil and spoiled food and started looking at a lot of these creatures. Here is just a, a recording of um, the first recorded image of Leeuwenhoek's of bacteria that he observed from scrapings from his teeth, which is also kind of interesting. So people began to see cells as the basic units of life. Um, where do these cells come from? That was still a little bit in question. Um, for a long time, people had believed in the concept of spontaneous generation. Uh, they weren't really sure where life came from, and they thought it just spontaneously appeared. So uh, scientists uh, in 1668 by the name of Francesco Reddy had performed this experiment right here where he used this unsealed flask with meat in it as the control group and then these as the test variables. And he was trying to show that if indeed the flask were sealed, um, you would not have life growing on this piece of meat. Uh, and here he covered the flask with gauze, and in, the flies were attracted to the meat and could smell the meat, but that uh, the maggots were coming from the flies, not actually from the meat itself. Uh, people believed that somehow rotten meat could produce life. Um, here would be... Uh, would would look like what they're seeing, and yet this meat did not produce life, and neither did this meat. The life was produced up here, that the maggots were coming from the flies. 
But that really didn't convince people. Um, they still thought, well, maybe there's not enough air. You know, the, the ether or the air perhaps is what's giving life and making the maggots. So uh, a man named Louis Pasteur in 1864, uh, contemporary with a lot of the work being done with the microscopes, he performed some experiments, and these are some of his experiments right here, uh, with this special flask that has a curve in it. He boiled the broth right here, and he made this curved glass so that the microorganisms would maybe be able to get in here, but they would not be able to get up past this curve and into his broth. The broth remained free of microorganisms. As a matter of fact, the broth remained free of microorganisms for over a year, and there were no, there were no microorganisms in there. And then when he broke the neck on the flask, lo and behold, microorganisms came in. So this showed people that air can still get in. The microorganisms couldn't. People really started to think about that and started to adopt the idea that uh, is going to become part of our cell theory. I'm going to look at that on the next slide. And this is the part of the cell theory that is so important. All cells come from pre-existing cells. So Cells don't just randomly appear or come from air or come from spoiled food. Cells come from cells. And that was a, that was a very uh, novel idea at the time. Um, cells or products made by cells are the units of structure and function in organisms. They are the basic unit of life. These two points right here make up what we call cell theory. Rudolf Virchow was a scientist who stated these very simply in this cell theory. Um, he said all cells come from pre-existing cells. So it was much in line with uh, the, the idea of life coming from life that Pasteur was working on. And uh, here we just have some representative examples of different kinds of cells. So remember, cells are the basic structure of life and all cells come from pre-existing cells. If you would like to do some more work on uh, advanced proficiency, you are welcome to look more into uh, maybe Louis Pasteur or any of these other scientists. Um, they've all done a lot of uh, wonderful work and a lot of experiments that are very interesting. And if you would like to write some more about those, that would be great for advanced proficiency. So I hope you're enjoying this lesson.